Welcome to Rise, the United Independent Podcast. Together, we are rising above the fear and division of our current political landscape towards a civic culture of unity, care, and effective stewardship for the places we call home. On today's episode, I am joined by Hereditary Chief Phil Lane Jr. Chief Phil, or Uncle, as I now call him, has been at the center of the manifestation of the prophecy of the eagle and condor. For those who aren't familiar, this is an ancient story that describes the unification of the indigenous peoples from North and South America. The manifestation of this prophecy is an indication that humanity as a whole is transitioning from a phase of fragmentation, imbalance, and focus exclusively on the rational to the integration of spirituality and science, masculine and feminine, and most importantly for this podcast, of us versus them. I had the privilege and honor of going to Pine Ridge Reservation when I was 18 years old, and what I encountered there changed my life forever, both seeing the scope of pain and suffering, the historical legacy of genocide and colonization, as well as the deep currents of spiritual wisdom that have been preserved despite the cultural genocide that was perpetrated on indigenous peoples throughout North America. And so today, in honor of Indigenous Peoples Day, we are publishing this episode with Chief Phil Lane, who will be joining us in Austin. And as you'll see in this episode, Uncle Phil is carrying a deeply powerful message of unification of all peoples on earth, as well as the indigenous understanding of governance and how to sit in council together until the solution that serves the people best comes forward. So we have a lot to learn and we have a lot of healing to do in order to come back together as one human family. But this conversation lays a foundation for that work to happen at the Independent National Convention and beyond. I hope you'll enjoy this episode with my uncle and friend, Hereditary Chief Phil Lane Jr. I am so honored to be joined today by Hereditary Chief Phil Lane Jr., who is a member of the Hantua and Chickasaw nations. And I would love to just invite you, Chief, to open us with a prayer. Great. Thank you so much. Creator of the universe, most beloved one, all powerful one, most kind one, most compassionate one, ever forgiving one, O ancient of days, O blessed beauty, we call upon your holy power at this time and all our ancestors and beloved ones, past, present, and future. We're close in our closest vein to join us here today. The most beloved one, most precious one, we just ask that we can open our hearts and minds so we can visualize a future which all members of our human family are treated with the utmost respect and honor as sovereignties, ancient, imperishable, and everlasting. We ask that the Independent National Convention in Austin, be filled with creativity, be filled with love and kindness and compassion, be filled with those visions that our human family so desperately need at this time of our transformation, from adolescence into the beginning of our spiritual maturity. In creator of all good things, we call upon all the tribes and nations, the east from where comes the red sunrise, the south from where comes new life, the west from where comes thunder, lightning, and rain, the north from where comes the white snow and the purifying north winds. We come together in unity and harmony. Give respect to all the masculine dimensions of life and ask that those dimensions of life be balanced as they have been overbalanced and have brought us to the brink of destruction here on this Mother Earth. And we humble ourselves with great respect to our beloved Mother Earth, who represents, through womankind, the life-giving power and beauty of this beautiful life we have. We give thanksgiving especially to our mothers who brought us forth in this world through great challenge, and our fathers, and even if they were there only for our birth, or only as a result of our birth, we give thanksgiving, for we've been given this beautiful life. And we ask, creator of all good things, that we might put our hearts and minds together and creatively, and with the utmost respect and honor between us, create 
a new global civilization based in justice and let it begin at the independent national convention where we come together to dream and visualize a great future for all members of our human family. This episode of Rise is brought to you by the second independent national convention happening October 29th and 30th, 2022 in Austin, Texas. INC22 is bringing together leaders from across the independent sector to establish a vision for national transformation into good governance and your role in it. If you're interested in or passionate about moving America forward beyond our current divisiveness, rising as one independent nation for government that is truly of, by, and for the people, we think you should be there. Go to www.inc22.us to register for in-person attendance or get a link to the live stream and share the vision of an independent America with your friends. We look forward to seeing you in Austin or online as we let the world know that American independents are uniting and working together to create a more beautiful world. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. That really is the prayer of this convention. And so it's so meaningful to me to speak with you today to really give folks an opportunity to connect to the deeper spiritual and prophetic nature of this great convergence of all nations coming back together. And I have had such deep reverence for you since coming across your work a few years ago and seeing the way in which you have brought together so many different groups of people from all many different indigenous communities and nations to people of all different walks of life. And so you've been walking this road for many years and I see you as carrying the wisdom of this movement of what it means to heal from the past and come together in that spirit of family and And so I would love to just open with an invitation for you to share about the journey that you've been on and where you feel we're at in that journey now. Well, I want to provide a context, I think, to so important for us to understand in terms of where we are right now in the unfolding of the United States of America. As we know, a group of Protestant men came together to create the Constitution of the United States of America. And they drew very, very heavily on the great law of peace given by the peacemaker many years before anyone from the European tribes arrived here in the Americas. And even when they were drafting this, according to the stories that have been passed down, it was actually Iroquois hidden in the attic, and they would consult with them at various points in development constitution. And as you know, Benjamin Franklin and other founding quote unquote fathers spoke the Iroquoian language. And so they got it right from the heart of the people. And I would say that there was two things that were left out that we're now really seeing the results of. One, that women played a primary role in the in in the great law of peace. And of course, when you have only a group of white males who are Protestants, leaving out Catholics, leaving out relatives who are Jewish, leaving out anybody of color. You know, although certainly I have great respect for the many good things that the United States of America has achieved, when you leave out and don't understand the important role of women, the female qualities of life in the development of a nation, you've left out a a major piece. The second part is 
they didn't ground this in spirituality as the great law of peace given by the peacemaker is. That really is so important to understand that we're both spiritual as well as physical beings. And that morals, ethics, guiding principles that promote cultural and spiritual understanding and guide us along a path, a respectful path of unity and harmony is so important if we are over the long run going to maintain and sustain and harmonize those who are participating in that nation. And so we can see today that one of the things to me that's at the core of the change that has to happen is fundamental before all else is to understand we are one human family one human family and the herd of one and the honor the upliftment the healing of one is the honor upliftment and healing of all but also we're intimately connected to all life so when i say the herd of one is a herd of all it means also those relatives of the mineral world, our mineral relatives, water and the earth, our plant relatives, our animal relatives, and of course, obviously, our human family. Every part of creation has a purpose. That's why when we thought about you know, the land around us, we thought about every part of it. We realize how important and sacred was the duty of the milkweed, for instance, because it's the milkweed that feeds the monarch butterfly in which the monarch butterfly lies, lays its eggs. So as caretakers of Mother Earth, as caretakers of Mother Earth, our responsibility is to understand how all these things fit together with respect. Now, it's very interesting. I remember back in of the late 1960s, there was research was done looking at indigenous young people and European young people in terms of how they learn. And they found that the languages, English, French, German, the Romance languages, and other languages in the world, are noun-based languages, noun-based. So they see the world as a snapshot. They found that indigenous languages are verb dominated languages. They see the world as a motion picture. Of course, when I heard that, I thought to myself, I don't want to be a half wit. <laughs> I want to be able to see the world as a snapshot, but also as a motion picture, because it takes both to really understand the world around us. And so when you have a linear point of view only, when you, for instance, only believe that science is the only power and materialism is the only power that we have as a foundation, we're in trouble. Because science without spirituality or religion is truest meaning, which means to reunite, to bind together, although it's lost its meaning to many people, including myself, when I call it, we use the word spirituality. But science without spirituality becomes a Frankenstein. At the same time, spirituality or religion, in its highest sense, to bind together, to unify, without reason, without science, becomes fanaticism. So we have to have both. So that's why it's so important to reflect on the Constitution of the United States that this important dimension is left out. Now, at the same time, of course, we can see tremendous influences coming in from various religious perspectives, some very literal, and see the world in a very literal point of view, not understanding that anything that's spiritual has infinite meanings. I think that's an important consideration that I see happening in the INC 
is indigenous people are being invited to be part of every dimension of the INC, including the planning, including the opening ceremonies, including sharing directly from indigenous peoples, their perspective of what should be included in the platform that the INC will put forward for 2024. So what I'm really thankful for in the INC is that indigenous people, Native Americans are involved in every dimension of the convention. And that means from the beginning and the opening ceremonies, it means speakers, it means really asking the Native American community and its many incredible national organizations what they feel should be at the in the platform regarding indigenous peoples. And I can say at this time, if we look at the condition of many of our tribes and nations across the United States and Alaska, even though people think that the, even the gaming tribes somehow, all those members of the gaming tribes are somehow wealthy, it's just not true. We're facing tremendous challenges within our native communities. Tremendous challenges. And tremendous challenges in employment, in housing, in decent health care, all of these dimensions. And from my perspective, and that's what we're doing, we're actually going and asking the National Congress of American Indians, for instance, National Indian Education Association, the American Indian Science and Engineering Society, actually asking them, and there's many more, what is it that you see is needed to really have indigenous people, Native Americans in the United States of America, really be restored to the health and well-being of the past and even greater because up to this time they've taken from indigenous people and come up with some kind of a uh, platform for indigenous people that really not fully addressing the needs of indigenous people rather than those who don't know what's happening going through and taking from native americans and then creating something that they see from what they think they know is not going to happen at the independent national convention whereas we're drawing on and asking all these various national organizations what is it that you see needs to happen so that the platform is solidly built on for the first time ever on what indigenous people have to say I can say the same thing because I'm very closely working with veterans and got a chance to attend a gathering of special forces through the Warrior Angel Foundation, Andrew Marr and his dear brother Adam and other veterans from all the special forces. And they had this 48 by four sacred run and staking ceremony in which we participated fully in supporting them, which meant that every four hours, they ran four miles at a total of 48 miles in 48 hours. So it was pretty intense. It was right there close to Houston. And when we see the treatment of our veterans, and I can truly say that our indigenous people, even before we were citizens, fully participated to support the United States of America in World War I. And you see the condition of our veterans and how they have to almost, it's below them to beg, but they almost have to, anyway, it's very disrespectful the way they're being treated, very disrespectful. So along with indigenous people, I'm also very pleased that Andrew Marr and all these special forces veterans are going to be involved. So we can really hear about how they've been treated 
and the stories they believed, truly believing that they were there not because they were trained to kill, but there because they truly believe they were protecting our great country, our great nation. And I can say that I was there as a little boy when President Eisenhower spoke when he dedicated McNary Dam. I remember sitting on my father's shoulders. And I remember really listening to him speak then, a beautiful talk, but also his final talk, his final speech before his resignation in which he warned us about the industrial military complex. And as I see it, the United States has been at war for as long as it's been in existence, from one war to the next. And what we've done to indigenous people in this process by misguided policies and misguided understanding and racism and colonialism, we continue to do around the world and that's not to say that somehow the United States has not been and done good things. But at the same time, I think we have to have a real deep look at our policies about war versus peace. And I believe we have to become the world's leader in forging peace. In fact, as indigenous people, we have a vision. And that is to unify our human family, which I believe is a foundation of this whole thing. And that's why I'm so pleased at the convention. They're ensuring tremendous diversity, as great a diversity as we can find. Because it's a diversity of perspectives that really are going to give us what we need. In fact, I really like the guidelines that we've shared about how we should speak to each other with great respect and, and honor. Because with love and compassion, the clash of differing opinions ignites the fire of truth. And that's what we want. We want truth. But we want truth that unites. Truth that brings together our human family. So that's one foundation. Unify our human family. We are one human family. All this division that's going on, separating people into this group, into that group, into this group, into that group. You know, purposely is being done. Purposely, this is happening because of, quote unquote, partisan politics, adversarial partisan politics of which I have care to have nothing to do with whatsoever. So what we find today in this two party system, with all due respect, is these adversarial partisan politics in which it's not policies that are really at the forefront. It's not principles that can bind us together, unify us, it's we get into personalities, tearing down other human beings. It becomes essentially backbiting, gossip, slander, whatever which you need to win, people do. And to me, that's not going to take us any place but down the tube. And so that's why also I've I, my perspective is that as this movement, and I see it as a movement, and I see it more than a political movement. I see this as a spiritual movement. Yes, there's a political dimension to it, but we're going to transcend what we know as partisan politics that are adversarial, that tear each other down, that cause disunity, because people are looking for unity. They're looking for coherence. And so that's why I was saying that I remember my uncle Vine Deloria Jr. telling me back in the 1960s when he really revitalized the National Congress of American Indians. And he said, you know, he said, in the future, when you have close elections, a very small number of people in unity can move that vote and be decisive in terms of who's elected. I certainly believe that this capacity to truly change things by working to come together in unity, as we're doing at the Independent National Convention, is going to have quite an impact over time as things unfold. 
And of course, that's going to cause attack. But I think it's so important we don't get pulled into this. I believe we should stand in our spiritual strengths, our values, move to the positive alternative we wish to create without giving away our energy fighting the negative. I remember my sister told me one time about fighting. She said, you know, when Adam got in a fight with the devil, they both got thrown out of the Garden of Eden. So our, our, my, my perspective on this, which I'll certainly share in my presentation there, is that don't allow ourselves in any way, shape, or form to be pulled into these adversarial partisan politics. Focus on the principles. Focus on the policies that uplift the people. That's, that is, to me, where we need to go. Because people are seeking, again, they're seeking unity. Uh, people are getting disgusted with all this disunity and this group and that group and all. Of them. And one of the greatest pains is not knowing where to find the truth when you're looking for it. Because we know that we have going on truly an information war, an economic war, a conventional war we see in Ukraine and, and Russia, a spiritual war, cyber war, religious war, and all these conflicts. My prayer is when we come together at the INC that we do so again with unity and diversity. We speak to each other in a respectful manner. We don't allow ourselves to be pulled into attacking others while we're there, but rather focus on what we know is needed to turn things around. There should be no question when we understand oneness and justice that the wings of the eagle are two, one's man and one is woman. Until both wings of this eagle have equal power and respect and honor, the eagle of humanity will never fly to its promised majesty. At the same time, we see today in the world, every four seconds, a member of our human family is dying from starvation. Many of those children, can you imagine? Every four seconds, as we sit here talking, a human being is dying from hunger. And we see as well in the United States of America how many relatives of our human family are dying, not just from hunger and disease, but from unhappiness that comes from living in a system that has lost its spirit and having to turn to drugs to cover up all the pain and dysfunction that's going on behind the scenes and they're dying of overdose everywhere. And this is increasing. And really, when you think about it, it's the consumer that's consuming all these drugs that has to be helped to end this quote-unquote war on drugs. We're not fighting the war in the right place. <laughs> we're, flying it, we're fighting at the supply end, but the real place to end it is the consumer end. So that's what we have to focus on, the well-being and health, especially of our young people and children and infants. My uncle Vine Deloria Jr. said, any society or nation will be judged in the future in how they treat those at the sunrise of their life and those at the twilight of their lives. Because we understood that the future was our children. We also understood the wisdom of the people resided in the elders. So our children had the benefit of the wisdom of the elders. They weren't just on a graph, which I've seen before, that shows the value of a human being that goes up around 55 and goes down because of your value of what you can produce in the workplace goes down. The value of the elder was there because they carried the wisdom, the spiritual wisdom and insights for the younger generation to go further than they. Because I really believe if we've been a good parent, if we were a good grandparent, that those children, our grandchildren, children, should go way further than us. Then we've been a good teacher. 
then we've truly helped those beloved ones to to fulfill their potentiality, which is unlimited. I'll go ahead and guide this. <laughs> I just went on. Has this has been helpful? It's been beautiful. And there are so many threads of what you shared. And to summarize the last 200 or several thousand years in a, such a short period of time, I felt like you covered such a great deal of both the pain of the past and the challenge of our current moment, as well as the way of being with each other that's going to help us restore that balance that you were speaking to. And no. it, I, it reminded me, before you even shared the metaphor of the eagle, it reminded me of, of my teacher, Joanna Macy, who describes it in the same way, that if humanity is a bird and only the masculine wing or the rational wing or the linear wing is flapping, then we'll only go in circles. But that it's when both wings are actually in their full power that we can actually move as one wherever yes. we choose to go. Which reminded me of the phoenix, which is the symbol of this movement, which I think is so powerful because it's it represents that coming together of those two wings. And it also represents us rising from the ashes of the past through the fire of transformation, coming back to that fire again to sit around in circle and part of the rising through the ashes is acknowledging that pain and having a very mm -hmm. clear and heartfelt conversation around what that pain has been and what pain is still ongoing that hasn't been resolved. Mm -hmm. And that kind of clear eyed, compassionate conversation about these things is, is the kind of mature leadership that I feel coming forward in this movement that's not partisan and it's willing to look at things in this sense of responsibility and stewardship that sense of responsibility for care i think is at really at the heart of the people who are coming together here is that we've realized that there there isn't actually effective stewardship coming from all of the fighting and the us and them and is there anything you want to respond to in what i just shared for sure one of the things that is always been very troubling to me is that if one party comes up with a good idea the other party tears it down simply because they didn't come up with it now the other party can come up with the same idea maybe framed a little bit different and then the other party is against it because they didn't come up with it for me i want to find the light from whatever lamp it comes from i don't care what the lampshade looks like really to me, this is what this is about, is finding what are the best solutions, not only facing ourselves as citizens of the United States of America and citizens of indigenous nations, but also we are part of a human family. And so what we do here impacts all members of our human family. We have to take that in consideration as well. We have to be able to understand why there are those nations that hold us in such contempt. We have to understand why indigenous peoples still are feeling betrayed and feeling treated unjustly. At the same time, I want to say this, that from our indigenous understanding, there is no death, just a change of worlds. That when we're born of this physical world of time and space, each of us is born of sovereignty, ancient, imperishable, and everlasting. Each of us. That's where sovereignty comes from, each of us. So important to remember. And that this soul we're given, I call it soul, which transcends this world of time and space, which is eternal, that there is no death. So all those relatives who quote unquote perished over the last 500 years, and it's estimated that prior to Columbus landing in 1491, there was a little over 100 million indigenous people living across the Americas and living together in relative peace and harmony, relative peace and harmony. 
there was conflicts, but nothing compared to the battles of Genghis Khan or Attila the Hun or Alexander the Great or what we read in Caesar's diaries and on, you know, where hundreds of thousands of men were pitched against each other in battle and where we find, you know, so many people were living in poverty in this very pyramid-shaped economic system where the very few, even the Magna Carta, was not about the common person, quote-unquote, the common person, the, we could say, Chewa Chasha, the natural human being. It was about the lords having power along with the king. So again, we say over the Magna Carta, we have to look at these things. We need to look at these things. <clears throat> with this understanding, we see that those suffering so deeply from injustice, from the lack of freedom to practice their own spirituality, you know, fled Europe. And they fled Europe in sometimes boats that were really third class, and many of them sank. They had no idea really where they were going. And yet the pain was so great and the desire to find a place of freedom was so great, they left anyway. Many of them starved when they got here. They were cared for, as was the tradition, to care for those who were suffering by indigenous people here. At the same time, I believe it's so important to see this from a perspective of a struggle that really went on between science, materialism on one hand, and spirituality, a respect for life on the other, that meaning that all life, that all we're related to all life. And so this struggle has gone on for about 500 years. And we have our ceremonies that we go to, our inikaka, the sweat lodge, in which we go and a lot of heat, and so forth. And you suffer some, but you pray through that suffering. You pray. And when you leave that sweat lodge, you feel much better. Or we have sun dancing, which I began back in 1980. And this old elder, Pete Catches, like to dance two days and two nights nonstop. And it was hot. And it was challenging. But after those two days and two nights of prayer, and you continue to go no matter what, thunder, lightning, and rain, whatever. When you left that ceremony, you were feeling better. You had grown spiritually. I want to suggest we've all been through a 500-year Sundance. Not just indigenous people, all human beings. And those who have continued to hold on to their spiritual foundation and to respect their lineage and themselves as human beings are coming out of this 500 year Sundance stronger and more unified than ever before. With all our ancestors closer than our closest vein, because there is no death, just a change of worlds. So that's why I'm saying that what we're doing here at the INC is something that not only has impact nationally, in the United States, it has impact galactically in a way. Because we know everything's connected to everything else. We know the atomic chart operates everywhere in the universe. We know that there is an energy from these paired electrons. They can stretch them out further and further. When one turns this way, the other one turns the other way. So we know also there's an energy beyond the speed of light. It's instantaneously. It connects everything all at once, everywhere, we can imagine. So what happens here impacts the entire galaxy. Our galaxies are it's getting so huge beyond our understanding. So it's so important that no matter what challenges we might have before us, that we really come to the INC and see this not as event, but as a process, as a movement, a movement 
that will slowly but surely gain strength and expand and move forward, not just to 2024, 2028, but beyond that. And that what we do in forming the seed crystal of this movement in Austin is so important that we come there and understand that it'll take some time. But when we form the seed crystal, which I have complete faith will be done, this seed crystal of a new global civilization is what we're really talking about. A time when the America, quote unquote, the United States of America, will become as great in spiritual degrees as it achieved material degrees. Our prophecies say this will happen. That we will become a center of peace on earth. And that's going to take really the involvement, the participation of all, especially young people. First, thank you. That was, I felt that throughout my entire body, what you just said. And this idea of a seed crystal, one of the really fascinating and beautiful things about the mineral kingdom is the way that crystals form through this coherent pattern of relationship. And that once that coherent pattern has been established, then all of these other particles can mirror that and fit into that pattern as it grows. And so what I see, what I hear you referring to is that if we can have this pattern of healing, this pattern of restoring and renewing that tapestry, that fabric, that sense of belonging to each other, even if it's at a small scale, if we can show that it can be done, yeah. we can broadcast yeah. that message to the world, then more and more people will be able to take that pattern and bring it into where they are. And that pattern of coming back together is of global and interplanetary significance because once it starts, it's almost like a flame. It will spread through the all of these different parts of the world. And one of the things that I believe about Turtle Island, about the United States of America and this whole continent is that all of the people who are here now in this time are either First Nations, indigenous people who were here in, this, in their ancestral homelands, slaves who were brought against their will from other countries and other continents, or immigrants, people who through some pain of where they were currently residing yeah. took up the great risk of coming here because of a desire for another possibility and so we have here on this land such a tapestry of, of all of the pain of all of humanity and well that's created strife and struggle and we've perpetuated that pain in so many different ways i see it as a blessing because it means that in healing it here, we are actually healing it for the entire planet. If it can be healed here, then it's possible for every division of all of humanity, the Jews and the Muslims, the India and Pakistan, China and Taiwan, every place where there is this rupture, if we can create this pattern of healing here, I can see that blossoming into a new planetary civilization, but it starts very humbly with where we are right now. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. And I think that the word humbly is so appropriate that we come in a humble way together as well. We're going to be offering talking circles, sharing circles. We've found this is a tremendous way for people to get a chance to know one another. And these were, shared with us by Eddie Bellrose and Abe Bernstick clear back in 1975. But we want to have those available for those who choose to participate, where they can literally listen to each other and get to know each other. This is, a, this is not just a thing of coming together and listening to a bunch of talks. This is about everyone that comes, feeling a part of this, being able to participate in the discussions. And I think talking circles or sharing circles, healing circles, many different names given to them that come from indigenous people can be of great help. Another dimension that we are sharing 
with the convention is our four world's principles of consultation for creating understanding, commitment, and trust among diverse members of our human family to identify opportunities and solve problems, determine the best course of united action. So what we've found in terms of principles for successfully having these dialogues that are so necessary is first of all, number one, respect each participant and appreciate each other's diversity. This is the prime requisite for consultation. Value and consider all contributions. Belittle none. Withhold evaluation until sufficient information has been gathered. Contribute and express opinions with complete freedom. Carefully consider the views of others. If a valid point of view has been offered, accept it as your own. Keep to the vision at hand. Extraneous conversation is important to community building, which is part of talking circles, but is not consultation, which is solution driven. Share in the unified purpose of the community, the INC. Desire for the success of all concerned. Expect the truth with love and respect to emerge from the clash of differing opinions. Optimum solutions emerge from a diversity of opinions. Once stated, let go of opinions. Don't try to defend your position, but rather let it go. Ownership causes disunity and disharmony among the circle and almost always gets in the way of finding the truth. Contribute to maintaining a friendly atmosphere by speaking with respect, courtesy, dignity, care, and moderation. This will promote unity and openness. This last one, we really have added and thought through because many times consensus, full consensus is not possible as it was in the past when we had a long time to consult about things. Seek consensus with dedication and prayer, listening to everybody. But if consensus is impossible, let the majority rule. Now, there's a reason behind that. Remember, though, that decisions once made become the decision of every participant. After the community has decided, dissenting opinions are destructive to and undermine the success of the community's unified action desired outcome. Here's the key. So let's say there's five of us, and we fully had the opportunity to share our ideas and thoughts. And four relatives have a position that's different than mine. Now, if I drag my feet and try to undermine the position of my relatives, we won't know if it was a good decision or a bad decision, because it could be a great decision, but I've, my, by dragging my feet and undermining it, it has not been able to be achieved. So when decisions are undertaken with total community, unity, and support, wrong decisions can be more fully observed and corrected. This can't happen with disunity. That's why unifying our hearts and minds is so important, and unity and diversity. So those are another contribution that we're using in our deliberations as indigenous people, but also are hoping that it will also be utilized within the overall convention. Thank you for sharing that. It's, this is where it becomes the practice that it's not an idea, it's actually how do we be together and make decisions together yeah. and listen to each other and so I'm so grateful that you're bringing this to the convention because it's one thing to, to say that we stand for a principle and it's another thing to practice that principle. And I feel like those are very clear instructions on how to practice these principles. And when I was speaking with Fernanda Ibarra, who is helping to facilitate and set up the calls to help organize uh, the indigenous delegate group, she was talking about the difference between everyone having a seat at the table and everyone having a role in how the table is built. 
And I feel like what we are up to is building a new table and yes. restoring these principles, not just like swinging from one side to another side. And she said, it's not like indigenous leadership means like indigenous people taking power back away. And it's actually making sure that everyone has a voice, that that's a quality of of feminine and indigenous leadership is instead of trying to swing back in the other direction, it's how can we create an entirely new table, a new social contract. And that is a very deep transformation that to me has something to do with this notion of sovereignty and that power you know, comes through each of us as children of our creator as our through our connection to great spirit or the that which is greater than us we can become agents of that force and so it's it's shifting power at a very fundamental level from this top down view to actually how does each of our individual powers come into coherence and right relationship with each other through consensus wherever possible so that we can be aligned in and be a shared conduit for that power to come into the world instead of fighting for who gets the authority to then be at the top and have power over others. And so this kind of bottom up orientation to coming into consensus wherever possible through the integration of our individual perspectives, that seems to me to be at least part of the new table that's being created at the fundamental level. Yes, yes, yes. And I would say, you know, seek to understand before seeking to be understood. And so from the indigenous perspective, we are gathering from all the many national organizations, indigenous organizations, their perspective on what they feel needs to be included in terms of really bringing into balance the indigenous people with the overall members of the human family in the United States of America. At the same time, I believe we need to do the same with our veterans. We need to do the same with our beloved members of our community from Africa, from every part of Mother Earth. And also those that are feeling as if they are somehow losing their place because there's so many different diverse members of our human family emerging, which, which by the way, is really truly what you said, because we have the diversity of the human family right here. And we can solve this. We can uplift this. We can, I can see it happening. One of the one of the great experiences I had at Burning Man, I must say, my relatives, they said, what in the world? You're 78 years old. What in the world are you going to Burning Man for? And I said, you know, I believe in the independent investigation of truth my own self. I don't want to hear it from somebody else's mouth or somebody else's, what they heard through their ears or what they saw through their eyes. I want to see it for myself. And it was something to me to see the incredible creative power that, that in 10 days could put together a city of 80 or 90,000 people with a really excellent hospital, actually had an airport, all lined out where you knew where everything was around a circle. And yes, you could find everything at Burning Man you can find in any big city. They were right there in the program, there were different type forms of different types of orgies. You know, now, if that's what your thing was, yes, you can go have org orgies. But I also found where I went to Mystic and I went to the temple when they're having various events there. And in the camp I was in, Rainbow Lightning Camp, as well as, you know, the Amazon camp was close by and other camps. What I found was truly human beings, truly understanding we're one human family truly respecting and honoring each other. That moved me. Plus, I saw this incredible creativity that once it's, in a good way, 
I don't want to say harnessed. I don't know exactly how to say this. I don't want to make it like, but once, once those, once the diverse elements can find a common principle centered path that respects and honors all cultures and respects all life, once that's aligned, there's nothing we can't do. There's nothing we can't accomplish. And it's happening. I actually wrote an article a few years ago about the way that ethos of Burning Man could be of service to a political movement or a spiritual political movement. And the core message that I was trying to convey was that while it's important to feel the pain of the past, we can actually use the energy of that feeling to then move into creation not to bypass the feeling, but that the pain can actually become the fuel of what do we actually want to create. And as a movement, instead of protesting for or against something, we can actually, I, I also don't want to use the word harness, but we can direct that creative energy into creating beauty, into creating community, into restoring our ecology and our relationships to place. And it feels like all this energy that, you know, sometimes burst to the surface with riots or protests, it feels like the deeper urge is to create and to create a more beautiful world. And so I, I feel that this movement is that it is. And in that way, it is connected to Burning Man, but it's so much more than just a party. It's about how do we direct that exactly. deep wellspring of human creativity and the desire to, to actually restore balance and give people an opportunity to enact that in their local communities, give them permission and a sense of belonging to something greater than themselves where many people can unite in that effort. And that's what I feel this movement is. Exactly. And I am really pleased with the indigenous people who have committed themselves to be at the INC. For instance, Lila June Johnston, who is one of our most magnificent young people of our human family and who is an incredible singer poet and has just finished an incredible phd dissertation that demonstrates so beautifully that the entire turtle island we're referring to the north here was one huge garden in which every part of that garden was taken care of for all life and if you think about it, it, that expanded clear across the Americas. And that's why almost 90% of all the food in the world was domesticated in the Americas because of this focus on our Mother Earth, this focus on achieving harmony as best we could. So we'll have Lila June, and I know she's going to be really exciting to uplift us. Kevin Locke. Who, I, who is our foremost flutist and hoop dancer at 70 some years old <laughs> and great speaker to the unity of the human family. And we have Chief Richard Grimes and the Lone Star Drum coming that are both a Sundance drum and a powwow drum to open and close the INC as well as to give us some good round dance songs. Because from my perspective, this has to be almost a celebration of joy and happiness. Like my father always said, he says, if you can't be happy today, what day are you waiting for? So along with addressing those challenging issues we have before us as a human family, we also want to do that with some joy, with happiness so that we give a model, an example, that really our purpose here is to be a happy and joyful being. And that's the kind of world we want to create. And so the best way to exemplify that is by creating that world and having the joy and happiness from within it, which is going to be very encouraging to people considering the state of politics at this point in history. In the first episode of of this podcast in speaking with Carla Ballard, who's co-hosting the event, mm -hmm. she describes it as celebrating humanity and that 
this political movement actually gets to be an expression of all of us bringing our gifts and being able to receive the blessing and the benefit of those gifts and to be in celebration of them because there's so much richness here and there's so much capacity for goodness and beauty and truth. And so I, I am really looking forward to the, just being there in the room with all of these different people of all these backgrounds, bringing that spirit of celebration, bringing their gifts, whatever they're here to contribute. And I wanted to maybe bring us into a close with a question about prophecy, because I know that you've been carrying and have been part of the manifestation of the man of prophecy. And you know, there are many, and they come from different cultural traditions. And you know, there's the eagle and the condor, which is the, the unification of North and South America and what comes through that unification of polarities or of masculine and feminine. And there's also the Lakota prophecy of the white buffalo calf woman. There's the Hopi prophecy of the blue kachina. And prophecy may seem like it's describing something far out there or something in the future. And my sense is now we are living in the times of prophecy. And so I'm curious how you relate to the prophecies that you're connected to and what do you see in terms of the manifestation of those prophecies and maybe what we are on the edge of manifesting in connection to those prophecies? Yes, we are living in the days of fulfillment of the prophecies, not the day of the prophecies, the fulfillment of the prophecies. And in general, if you look at the prophecies of the many great visionaries across the Americas, you know, it was understood for about 500 years, this brief time in eternity, we would go through this great spiritual winter time, a time of great testing. Outwardly it would seem like fire and vengeance, but inwardly it would be purifying water. And now we are leaving that 500 year winter time and we've entered into a tremendous springtime and for those relatives who all they know is winter and the snow and seeing all the rivers frozen and everything covered with ice and all of a sudden comes that first spring storm boom and all of a sudden everything you saw of the white snow begins to disappear and all of a sudden, you begin seeing earth underneath it. All those ice-bound rivers and lakes begin to break up. And instead, you'd be seeing roaring rivers come down, breaking through all the barriers in their path. You can see a tiny seed fall into a small crack in a rock and crack the rock open. And so those that don't understand the process of life are saying, it's the end of the world. It's the end of the world. No, it's only the beginning of the spring. And that's where we are. And I think one of the most, in terms of the Christian Judaic tradition, primary Christian, I guess it would be, you know, for the Christian, if you look at it from a Christian perspective, in the prayer they say that, Jesus gave the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. So that's what all the prophecies talk about. Beginning with what we call the lesser peace. At that time, we're going to see what's happening right now. And that is, we can see we're coming together on many different levels in sharing through technology, through the internet, which was prophesied, by the way, also that this would happen. The internet would come. But also we can see that with the effort to understand we're one human family, to unify our human family, and to end war, when we begin to think about how much is being expended in war, and we end that and begin peace on earth, Think of the 
huge amounts of resources that then can be expended in the whole healing process, in the refining of this incredible brain we have with healthcare that truly helps every human being to live to their fullest, to ensure that every human being has a good education, to ensure that every human being has fresh water to drink, a place to live, all those things which each of us, a sovereignty, ancient and perishable and everlasting, have a right to have so that we might become all that we can become. And we can see as well all the incredible technology that's emerging. And I'm not afraid of this technology. I believe we have to use the best tools available to us. I remember back in the late 1970s, we went to see us, my friend Phil Lucas and I went to see this dear brother, Gary Hilaire, who was a fifth generation Lummi Carver among the Lummi Reservation up close to Bellingham, Washington. And we got there, he was using a chainsaw to prepare a totem pole. And of course, in those days, those early days in the 70s, everybody had to have a beaded belt buckle. You know, I tried to grow braids, but my hair is very curly at the time. Looked like two, looked like somebody stuck me in an electric light socket. And my dad said, well, some people can wear braids, some can't, you can't, son. So this, you know, doesn't make any difference in the long run. He said, he said they'd just be little tiny things anyway, which I know at this point. Anyway, my friend Phil saw Gary, this traditional carver, using a chainsaw. He said, Gary, you're supposed to be a traditional carver. How can you be using a chainsaw to carve a totem pole? And Gary talked very slowly, turned the chainsaw, and he said, well, he said, I think we have to have a visit. He said, my Lummi people are among the most wisest and knowledgeable people on Mother Earth. We always use the best tools available to us. If there was a 747 we could have boarded to go see the world, we would have. And so I think we have to remember that all these technologies that are emerging, artificial intelligence, all these incredible technologies, it's how they're used and those hands and who they are and the values they have. If the values are about really understanding we're one human family and understanding we want to uplift all members of the human family, that's how these tools will be used. If the tools are about trying to keep an elite of a few people in control and power of the world, they'll be tried to be used for this. But that day is over. The day of the triangle is being replaced with a circle, which encompasses the triangle, but includes everyone, everyone. And that's why, you know, they had the council teepee in the center of the circle so that everyone would have the same distance to walk to it. That everybody is respected from the smallest child to the oldest elder. And that's what the INC, I believe, is about. It's about a celebration of our humanity, of our human family, and how we as a human family can truly come together and create a world in which all human beings are respected and honored and a time that we call the day that shall not be followed by night. That, that really impacted me. Yeah, the deep reverence that I have for you is both from what you've done, but also I can feel the truth that you speak and the energy of that direct communication that, yeah, it took me a moment to just feel the spiritual truth of what you just said. And I wrote a song recently where one of the verses is, um, red roads made of clay, all nations praise the day. We surrendered to the way you can lay it down because I have felt that day coming yes where all nations get to rejoice in that feeling of returning and i feel so blessed to be able to devote myself to living that prayer 
as a way of honoring the past and a way of honoring all of the generations to come. So thank you for being an inspiration for me. Thank you for speaking the truth in a way that's so clear and so compassionate and so coming from the wisdom of your life and the deep connection to spirit that you have cultivated over the course of your life. It's it's the quality of leadership that I feel we most need now, and I'm deeply grateful for you. Thank you so much. And just to take you back to my beginnings, I had the great fortune to begin my journey back in March 1967. And in March 1970, I traveled to Bolivia. And on July 9th, 1971, in this picture behind me, you can see me sitting with my elders and Quechua relatives at the Island of the Sun. And it was on this day, July 9th, 1971, that literally the prophecy of the reunion of the condor and eagle was fulfilled. I didn't understand at that time as a young man that the reason why I was being treated with such love and respect and that I would be deep in the Andes in Bolivia and there'd be relatives coming. I could see their them holding torches coming six days on foot through the Andes with hardly anything to eat to come and greet me and to hear more about our prophecies from the north. And it was on this day that I really became fully 100% committed to doing the best I could to see the fulfillment of this ancient prophecy come to pass. And I remember after we prayed and we went to the various holy places on the Island of the Sun, went to the Island of the Moon, and arrived back at Copacabana, which, by the way, at that time, there was no one there. No one was in Cusco. It was empty of tourists, and not like it is now today. And I remember how amazed I was that these Quechuas I was with were from Sucre, uh, hundreds of miles away from Lake Titicaca, hours and hours away because of the lack of roads and so forth, and probably two days' journey. And yet they knew every part of the island of the sun, the island of the moon, and they took me back deep, deep into the kind of woods, kind of underbrush, and until we came to this huge stone in which had been carved the royal seat of the Incas. And I was getting ready to go home because my wife had been brutally raped there by a son of a very wealthy landlord who had actually done this to indigenous people themselves. And so they, they gave me the place of honor to sit where the Inca would sit. And they were all sitting together as one. And we prayed that night. And I remember so clearly at that altitude of about 13,000 feet, the stars are just amazing. Just amazing. It's just, and as I sat there contemplating this prophecy, which said that the indigenous people of the Americas, as well as those who had traveled from the Americas across the Pacific to clear to Aotearoa and all the Pacific islands, would become so illumined, they would enlighten the world. And literally, I could feel the rustling of indigenous peoples across the Americas. It's kind of like before locusts take off. It's so amazing how it happens. Just one locust, just one, rubs their wings against the next, and they just go shoo. And just in, in moments from that one locus, we all take off in this huge, unbelievable swarm. And that's what I felt that night, the rubbing of those wings, this beginning of this process. But it's not just about indigenous people. It's the understanding we have to come to that every one of us is an indigenous person of Mother Earth. Every one of us. 
So when we talk about these, this, what we're doing at the INC being a, a model of how we can be in terms of how we govern ourselves, how we elect those who govern us, all those dimensions we'll be exploring and gathering information about that in the same way we can see that as indigenous people are sharing more and more people are finding that they too resonate because they have it in their DNA. We have been living close to mother earth way longer than the last 500 years. Mother earth has been our teacher for all, every one of us for most of our history. And it's so important that each of us understand that we are each a representative of all that have gone before us. So gathered at the INC is not just going to be those people who are there. It's going to be all those relatives since the beginning of time that we represent will be with us spiritually. So it's going to be a huge gathering. <laughs> you look at it that way. Even if it's going to be a small gathering in terms of material numbers. Is that doesn't count. It's that beginning, that seed crystal we're lying, laying, that is founded in enduring spiritual principles of respect and kindness, integrity, forgiveness, justice, compassion. This foundation is what we're building and gathering all the information gathering all the different perspectives that we can then weave together in a beautiful new pattern for the unfolding of a new global civilization, for unifying our human family, ending war, and beginning peace on earth by 2030. Thank you for all of your leadership and being the manifestation of that prayer. And I feel honored to be holding that prayer with you and having the entire event itself be a prayer that is in connection with all of those ancestors that have held the same prayer. And there have been so many times in history where we have tried to enact this sense of possibility of peace. And it's on behalf of all of those people who came before us who have been holding this yes. prayer and all people across time that that we are coming together and engaging in this great work together. So thank you for contributing to that and being one of our elders, one of our leaders of the of vision and of prayer. And thank you for everything that you're bringing to this movement. I, mm -hmm. I feel truly blessed to be getting to do this with you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to add one more thing. Our elders call the path we must take the fourth way. The fourth way transcends assimilation. Assimilation, we can see, is a path some believe that will end up in happiness. But we know assimilation does not work. The second path, the fourth way transcends, is resignation giving up, falling in drugs and alcohol, whatever we can do to cover our pain up. The third is conflict. And we know well from our own history that conflict is not going to get us where we need to go. It creates more conflict. But the fourth way is rebuilding trust, forgiveness, reconciliation, and understanding truly we are one human family and we must not rest until we make everybody we know a mother, father, aunt, uncle, niece, nephew, grandson, granddaughter. Then we'll know exactly how to treat them. And that's why from here on out, if it's okay with you, I want to call you Toshka, nephew. You call me Dek, she, uncle. Then we'll know how exactly how to treat each other with respect and love and compassion. Thank you, uncle. Aho. Thank you for listening to another episode of Rise, the United Independent Podcast. This is your reminder that this is so much more than a podcast. Chief Phil will be joining us in Austin alongside an incredible indigenous delegate group that will be bringing prayer 
and helping to support an interfaith spiritual foundation of this movement. I think for so many who don't feel like they have a political home, many may also feel like they don't have a spiritual home. And as Chief Phil described in this episode, this is a spiritual political movement or a political spiritual movement. It's the integration of a deeper current of how do we live in alignment with the principles that unite us. So if you've been looking for a political home or you've been looking for a spiritual home or both, this is a place that you can come to be filled up by both spiritual wisdom and a different kind of political discourse than you might've encountered in the mainstream or online. So I would really encourage you to come to Austin, to be in that community with other people who are independent from the two parties, but are seeking a deep spiritual and political foundation for their lives. Please go to www.inc22.us to register for the live stream and get tickets to be there in person. You're not gonna wanna miss it. Thank you.